Good day, citizens, and welcome. Or should I say, good day, citizens? Citizen! <laughs> and, and, I can't and, do it. I and, can't do the Nicandri laugh. And welcome to this week's, uh, and I would s- steal your descriptor and say special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Um, goodness, what a conversation we had this I love week. Dave Nicandri. Uh, he's one of my dearest friends. We, we do belong to what's called the Republic of Letters, which sounds a little pretentious, I, I suppose, but back then in Jefferson's time, it meant the group of like-minded people who get together and correspond and see the world in more or less the same way and find each other compelling and explore ideas together and sometimes actual landscapes. I've known Nicandri for a long time. In fact, he, he alluded to this. He talked about vehicles. Remember at the beginning of our yeah, conversation? Yeah. And I had written in my book, Message on the Wind, something about traveling in the Badlands with my mother in this really bad car my father had gotten for us. It was used, really broken down. Um, standard uh, transmission. And I said that on a number of our trips into the Badlands together, this would be in the late 1970s, that uh, we had had clutch problems. And I, then I said in the book, there's nothing like the exhilaration of a failing clutch, <laughs> which is true, as you know. Like Then you're, you're, you're fully alert. I, I could tell you stories. And so, and, and so I, I go to Washington State to give some talk in Seattle or Tukwila, and they said, would you like to be interviewed by this guy who is the director of the Washington State Historical Society? He's taken an interest in your book. So I said, of course. I didn't know him. And so I go there, and, and we sit down in his studio in his office. He'll remember this. And he said, citizen, I just want you to know that I loved your line, the exhilaration of a dying clutch. And DeCandre loved that line. And, and, and when I first met him, he brought this up. And we, we became friends over this, if you can imagine it. And since then, we've had this very, very rich friendship. We exchange visits. He comes on the Lewis and Clark Trail. Uh, we want to write a book together and have been planning to do that. Uh, I got to be the main editor of his, of his other book, uh, the, the one that made his name in the Lewis and Clark world, River of Promise, Lewis and Clark on the Columbia. He's helped me. Uh, he wrote the, uh, the foreword to my book on, on uh, Meriwether Lewis, the character of Meriwether Lewis. He's just – he's one of those great – individuals that you you know in your life who you know you can go to and they're always going to understand and they've got a point of view and they have they can read what you send them they can uh, write a response they they can challenge your thinking uh, they'll laugh with you at important times it's just uh, it's a great friendship and he comes on periodically not enough and our friend Russ from North Carolina, um, sent us an email saying, come on, more Nicandri. And so this is a perfect time to catch up with him. But as you say, we, we both sort of thought he would mostly want to talk about his forthcoming book on rethinking Captain Cook. But he he had another he had another story to tell. And we're the lucky ones for it. We so sure are. Let's go to the show now. And, and thank you all for listening. I want to re- remind you, because if I don't, I, I admonish for it. Uh, we need your support. Please go to jeffersonhour.com, Cuba, click Cuba, on Cuba, donate, Cuba. and you can uh, you can support the show in any number of ways, and and or write us a letter, ask President Jefferson a question. We really appreciate that too. Come on the Cuba journey in February. It's amazing and it's perfectly legal. Um, there are no visa problems. There, you're not going to get yourself uh, at odds with the State Department. Lots of people have inquired about it. This is a trip of a lifetime for 16 people, and, and we have just a few places left. Cuba in February, Hemingway, uh, the Cold War, uh, including the Bay of Pigs and the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, and of course Theodore Roosevelt um, assaulting San Juan and Kettle Hill on July 1st, 1898, what he called my crowded hour. I want to remind you, too, that next week's show is another episode of the Jefferson Hour Book Club, and Clay has uh, picked Robinson Crusoe. And we were, uh, actually, it was great because we, we got uh, Mr. Nick Andry to hang around and give some perspective on that, too. So we'll cut a little of that into the, into the program. Absolutely. So with that, let's go to this week's show, and thank you. Thank you, everyone. For listening. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with or about... President Thomas Jefferson. Seated across from me now is the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. Clay Jenkinson. And sir, I think I shall hand it to you and you can tell our listeners what we have in store for them this week. Oh my, a very special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I have a letter from one of our listeners in North Carolina saying, I'd like to know 
when we're going to hear again from David Nicandri. Some of my favorite shows from years past involve visits from David N. and the conversations between Clay and the two Davids. So we didn't need that prompt to want to check in with our dear friend David Nicandri, the former executive director of the Washington State Historical Society, the author of a very important book on Lewis and Clark called River of Promise, Lewis and Clark on the Columbia, and now about to publish, it's in the press actually, a book about Captain James Cook. And we'll get to all of that in some sense or other, but what we really want to hear is about a recent Lewis and Clark style adventure of our dear friend Dave Nicandri and his son. Uh, David Nicandri, welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Dave Swenson is still with you? Yes, he is. <laughs> that was a sort of an unusual way to, to frame that question. Is he still there? Well, I, was, I, I guess I half expected you to be the initiator, Dave, but uh, it's good to hear your voice as well. Well, you know, he's an Adamsite, and so I have to watch him. <laughs> I have to watch him at all times, you know. <laughs> Well, at least he's not a Hamiltonian. He's not a Hamiltonian. No, but, no, 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 never will be. But, you know, you know what an Adamsite is. It's someone who loved Jefferson and gets disillusioned with Jefferson but still wants to love him but is quite disillusioned with him. Well, that's a, that's a moderate position to hold or more extreme, uh, especially uh, uh, amongst, uh, amongst the Hamiltonian set or the anti-Jeffersonians, which are more... The more postmodernists. Postmodernists, postcolonialists, yes. Good day, citizen. Good to hear your voice again. <laughs> I love whenever you and I see each other, whether it's uh, two weeks or, or two years, um, we both say citizen at a very high pitch, and people around us look on us like, what is wrong with these two? Um, but that's all right. So you have recently been on an amazing journey with your son. Um, I won't go into any greater detail than that because I want you to tell the story. Give us get, give us a little update here. Well, it goes uh, it uh, goes back to uh, an episode in 1995 when my son Dominic would have been a sophomore or junior in high school. We're hockey fans. Uh, we're watching the NHL playoffs the spring of 1995, and Molson Beer, which was then as now one of the major sponsors of hockey on uh, CBC, and where I live here in Tumwater, is one of the southernmost cable systems that actually carries the CBC network. Anyway, that, that spring, they were carrying a promotion for a rock concert at Tuktiuk Tuk Northwest Territories, uh, which is northeast of Dawson City, which is probably uh, the most uh, best-known point of geography that uh, listeners would be familiar with, which was at that, which is on the Arctic Ocean, but which at that time did not have a road connection to it. Molson was going to fly in 200 people to attend this rock concert on Labor Day weekend, 1995. Metallica was the lead act, uh, lead act. Courtney Love was playing. Uh, and, uh, it, 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 it I certainly remember that, but it really stuck in my son's imagination. And now, now nearly 40 and with a career in logistics, he took note of the fact uh, Christmas two years ago that the Canadian government had extended a road from Inuvik, which is on the Mackenzie River Delta, to Tuktiuk, talk about another 120 miles north on the Arctic Ocean proper, as part of the build-up and infrastructure that all of the Arctic powers are engaged in now that we're in this uh, phase of global warming and the Arctic uh, is becoming a far more important in modern geopolitics. Anyway, just so to tie that all up, uh, at Christmas, it'll be two years this December, he said, Dad, uh, I think we should drive to touch the Arctic. What do you think about that? And I'd have to admit that now that I'm past 70, it seemed a little adventuresome, but I, but I could see he was really into it. And so I, I said, yes, let, let's, I agreed, let's do it. And um, I'll just close that part of the story out by saying that the trip was my son's idea, not mine. And it, there, there got to be kind of a, a sentimental quotient to the whole venture that I, I don't dare go into during the course of the broadcast, but in some and in substance that involved, I suspect, in fact, I know the notion that having taken many trips together through the years when he was a youth, 
that uh, that his old man's kind of getting laid in the innings, and maybe we should take one more grand adventure together. And so that's how it uh, was triggered, and we left for the north on August 15th of this year. Uh, your son's name is Dominic. He's in his 40s. You're uh, just over 70. The average age on the Lewis and Clark Trail, as you know, was about 24. I think the the correct term is, what were you thinking? <laughs> Well, I was thinking that it would be uh, a a time to kind of spend some quality time. Uh, He doesn't live far from me here in Tacoma. He's actually 39, not in his 40s, but that's uh, perhaps too small a distinction to dwell on. Uh, But uh, but it happened, the destination, of course, overlaps with uh, a, coincidentally, to a significant degree, with with a major research interest of mine, which is the career of Alexander Mackenzie, who in uh, in many ways was the progenitor of what became known as the Lewis and Clark Expedition. I had been in the Mackenzie River Basin before, and it's a huge watershed, which I'll, later in, in, the, in the show I'll try to give some dimension to. Uh, but I'd never actually been on the banks of the Mackenzie River. I have never had never seen it myself and certainly had not been to the Arctic Ocean which he reached on July 14th, 1789, which just, again, coincidentally happened to be the day the Bastille was stormed. But that's when Mackenzie, looking for an outlet uh, to Cook's River, or the headwaters of, of Cook's River, Captain Cook, having been in the North, North Pacific in 1778, misled a whole generation of, of, of Canadian explorers thinking that Cook Inlet was fed by a river that uh, emanated from deep in what's now the uh, northwest uh, Canadian interior. In fact, the Mackenzie River that he got on take goes to the Arctic, not the Pacific through Cook Inlet. And all that did was set up uh, uh, Mackenzie's subsequent expedition to Pacific Tidewater in 1793. And that is the voyage in particular that presaged what Lewis and Clark engaged in. Before you get too far down this path, um, I I just would like to make a short comment, if I might, sir. Yes. Not to drag you back into that uh, era of sentimentality, but I thought that you were telling of this this voyage with your son and thinking of uh, the trips you took when you were both younger is quite wonderful. And I'm certain that a lot of people envy you for having the opportunity to do it. Well, David... I have to say, I had so many friends and associates that I see routinely in my life here in uh, Thurston County, Washington, who would tell me, people my age, uh, that they would love to take a trip like that with their one or one or other of their children, and that the only time they hear from their kids is when they want money or they want to talk <laughs> about football, and the thought that uh, uh, someone's child approaching 40 years old would want to venture off into the relative unknown with just the two of them for upwards of two weeks was just an astounding leap for many of them. And so uh, your observation, David, is was not an unusual one. It was, it was actually quite common in the run-up to jumping off. You're a lucky man. So when, when Dominic tells this story 35 years from now, imagine, you know, well, the old man was starting to slow down and <laughs> he could barely walk by then, but I, got, I, I decided to take him on this sentimental journey to the Arctic, and I had to help him quite a bit. But uh, you know, these things just get better with time, my friend. You're still very vigorous. Uh, you do a lot of hiking. You know your way around. Uh, let me start with a really simple one: Tuk de Uk Tuk. Uh, what nation's language is that? Well, that would be uh, uh, the uh, uh, part of the. Uh, uh, Formerly known as the Eskimo, now the uh, Inuit. Uh, are, uh, of course, there are many subsidiary forms uh, of that nation, which runs all the way from uh, the Aleutian Islands uh, to Greenland. But um, but but it was uh, but it it, it is um, uh, 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 northern Inuit uh, uh, place name uh, that uh, it, uh, for for their little village that's on the Arctic Ocean. And so, what does it? What does the name mean? Do we know? I looked it up, but I can't profess it right now, which I regret because I should know that. Uh, but but I I don't know it. So let me let me back up here. You two leave um, Western Washington State in what kind of a vehicle? We had my Honda Ridgeline truck uh, with about a hundred thousand miles on it, 
we had uh, uh, a pl- dry food, uh, provisions, sandwich meat, uh, half a case of beer, <laughs> which perhaps will come back into the story later on, because uh, there's only so much alcohol you can take into Canada across the border. Uh, we had a, some. A, a lot, we had a tire repair kit, a battery charger, two spare tires because the Dempster Highway, which is the road that runs from Dawson Junction to the Arctic Ocean, is a notoriously difficult stretch of highway. And believe you me, it lived every much up to its reputation. Plus an eight-gallon spare uh, a gas can, and what uh, the tires in the can were in the back, and that is how we were equipped. Not quite as well prepared as Meriwether Lewis was, but good enough for this trip. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you you leave with spare tires and a whole range of other things because you can get resupplied, unlike Lewis and Clark. But you're anticipating that this is not just like driving along the trunk roads through uh, through Nebraska or Wyoming. I remember reading something you wrote about travel. Uh, And those of us who are old enough to remember will recall that it wasn't so long ago, certainly in the 1940s and 50s, that there were parts of even the American West in the more temperate latitudes where given the relative reliability, or should I say lack of of reliability in a lot of automotive uh, uh, manufacturing, you could break down in some places and it could be possibly terminal for you. <laughs> uh, David, I'm on the edge of my seat. I want to know how this turns out. But, sir, we need to take just a short break. I- I'm assuming you will you will stay with us. Absolutely. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. This is a special interesting conversation with our friend David Nicandri of the state of Washington who recently went on a on a wild journey with his son a sentimental journey from Washington state all the way to the arctic ocean and it was in a honda pickup right a ridgeline yes and so one of the issues for lewis and clark and for every expedition is is payload if you took all the things you want and need you couldn't ever leave so then if you add a U-Haul, then you then that is more stuff to haul and, and so on. So, yeah, you get it. It's, it's the Apollo 13 problem. There's always a payload issue. How did you decide what you could uh, take and what, and what you simply had to hope didn't break down? Well, we were trying to thread that needle. Uh, I didn't want to take a camper, a uh, pickup camper, or a trailer because uh, the final six, four or 500 miles, which is all dirt road, rock strewn, uh, often muddy and and uh, and occasionally perilous, as I'll get to, I hope. Uh, so I, wa- I wanted the more I wanted sufficient infrastructure, as you will, which a all-wheel drive pickup truck allows, but with a lot of the all the extra appurtenances that could that could hold you back or become problematic, and a, a medium-sized pickup truck with all-wheel drive, equipped with some spare tires and a spare gas can. A uh, cooler full of uh, cold cuts and bread and pop tarts and and dried <laughs> food. Um, that that seems sufficient. And with with some blankets uh, and a couple sleeping bags, uh, that's how we headed off. No tent. You're going to sleep in the vehicle or out on the ground? Yeah. Well, yeah, we were going to sleep in the vehicle, and that was clearly a mistake I, uh, because that that's not the most uh, re- rewarding uh, nightly refreshment. And uh, my son in particular came to regret it. I'm old enough that I could probably nod off in almost any circumstance. Uh, but it was really difficult for him. And if I had to do that part of the journey over again, I simply would have gotten some pads. We we, could, we would have laid out uh, the sleeping bags and the bed of the truck, maybe draped a tarp over us at night uh, so that the dew wouldn't fall on us or snow, as actually proved to be the case uh, climatologically. Uh, uh, and just hope that the grizzly bears didn't sniff us out and take a chunk out of our hide during the evening. I'm beginning to get some pretty clear images of this trip you took. Um, uh, help me out. Uh, scale of 1 to 10, how dangerous was this? Well, it's the most dangerous trip I've ever taken, and I drove cross-country in a 900cc Fiat 
from upstate New York to uh, northern Idaho in the winter of 1971, and I felt this was far more adventuresome, in part because that was a trip taken on the, the interstate highways. It was before the cell phone era, uh, and uh, I didn't have any credit cards, but there were, there were reasonably well-traveled routes, and I, I had long coats and heavy boots. And if the worst were to happen, and in fact it did, I broke down in western Nebraska and had to get towed to Fort Collins, Colorado. That's a long I tow. Within, I was within a, a zone of safety that I, I felt comfortable with. It, with This trip was truly jumping off into the relative unknown. Although I, ca- I have to say that there, were, there was a surprising amount of cell phone coverage through the northern B.C., which is reasonably remote. Uh, in its own right, um, uh, there would be whole stretches of time, 12, 14, 16 hours, where one would be out of cell phone range. And if something were to happen, you had to either rely on yourself or hope that some good Samaritan took uh, took pity on you. I get there was one other piece of equipment, I guess I should add, and it was an important one, and it played a minor role before the whole trek was over. Uh, uh, my son ordered a satellite phone so that uh, if, in fact, we got stuck in the Richardson Mountains overlooking the Mackenzie River Delta and there was no one around and the closest tow truck was 200 miles away, we could at least let our family know why they hadn't heard from us because we had broken down somewhere. So that was also a vital piece of extra equipment we took with us. How many days total from the moment you left your house to the moment you were back? It was 11 days total. We we had uh, we had anticipated twelve or thirteen, but the trip became expedited in a fashion because once we got into Yukon, uh, a, a, a severe winter-like storm blew in. In fact, Fort Nelson got two feet of snow the day after we left it on the way to Whitehorse. Of course, that same system had hit the region we were venturing into between Whitehorse through Dawson and north through Inuvik to Tuktoyaktuk. The last uh, thousand miles of the trip. So we we hit an unusually early onset of winter-like weather. And in fact, it's um, it's 30 degrees warmer up there in Whitehorse, Dawson, Inuvik, and Tuktoyaktuk than when we were there in mid to late August. Okay, so you're driving. How many nights did you wind up in a motel, by the way? We slept out three nights. The other, I guess, eight, we were in a, we were in a hotel. Now I'm going to sound like I'm a skeptic. Um, this doesn't sound very heroic. You're in a vehicle. It's a good vehicle. You've got spare tires. You've got credit cards. You've got a satellite phone. You've got cell service in a lot of places. You're on an actual highway. Uh, tell us, talk about adventure and risk and when you felt maybe you were one toke over the line. The adventure doesn't really begin until day four when we have uh, we've left Whitehorse. We're heading towards Dawson. Uh, which is the last major uh, outpost of civilization, I'll call it, until you until you get to the Mackenzie River Delta. Uh, so the weather was worsening. The, the the sky and the clouds were very foreboding. Uh, the temperature was in the mid 30s. And once you got past uh, the, <laughs> the uh, perhaps aptly named Tombstone Range of mountains, the tombstones. Yeah, the tombstones, which are about sixty miles uh, northeast of uh, Dawson City, you are entering remote country, um, and traffic is is very sparse. We ended up camping at a place called Engineer Creek. When we woke up the next morning, and headed up a seven mile rise uh, from the Olgave River, uh, the road was just a mud slurry. I mean, it was like it was like concrete. It was very slippery. There are, of course, no guardrails. We're going up on we're going up onto what is known as the Eagle Plains. Um, the road goes goes over the highlands rather than the river bottoms. Much like uh, clay, the Lolo Trail runs on the ridge of the uh, Bitterroot Mountains, not down in the river valley. So that's a <clears throat> geomorphic phenomenon you'd be intimately familiar with. So we're heading up. It's a spectral fog, intermittently snowing. There's no traffic. The gumbo is uh, three or four inches thick. I'm doing the driving that morning. I asked my son when it was all said and done, I said, was there ever a moment where you thought it was really getting dicey? And he said, yes, that drive up the hill that morning, 
because I couldn't tell what your feel of the road was like because where I was sitting in the passenger seat, it looked it looked really ominous. But we finally made it up to the top uh, after about six or seven hours. And at noon that day, the, the, the day we head up the hill, we reach a place called Eagle Plains, which is the only oasis, I'll call it, between Dawson City and Inuvik, which is the major uh, 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 settlement in the Northwest Territories. The only place to get gas. In fact, when you head out on the Dempster Highway, which is the name of this road that was initially built in the 1950s and 60s by the Canadian government from Dawson Junction to Inuvik, there's a sign that says no, no services for, I think it says, 760 kilometers. Those services are at a, plane called, a place called Eagle Plains. And when we got there to gas up, it being the only place between Dawson and Inuvik where we could do so, we were apprised of the fact that the road was closed because a, a truck, semi-trailer, had jackknifed a full 24 hours before we got there, which is to say the road had already been closed for 24 hours. By the time we get to this point, and we're told by uh, the, the gas station attendant that the, the highway department's not making any promises when the road would reopen. It could be any hour. It might be another whole day yet. At this point, a lot of people who had already reached that destination in the preceding 30 hours had, had exhausted their patience and were starting to turn around and go back. This was a real predicament for us because at this point, we had driven something like 2,300 miles. We're only like 40 miles from the Arctic Circle, and we're thinking to ourselves, it can't happen. We can't get this tantalizingly close, at least to the Arctic Circle, and not make it farther. So we st we were there. We, we had lunch. We, what we uh, one of the interesting things that happens when you're marooned like this is that you form a community with all the all the other people who are in the same predicament. Mike from Vancouver, for example, who we saw over the course of the next three days, literally a thousand miles apart from where we first encountered him at Eagle Plains, and you share information. And we were we caught a break because after only six hours delay, uh, the, the highway department, Yukon Highway Department, opened the Dempster Highway, and it was just a mad. It was like the Oklahoma uh, land <laughs> rush. There was just uh, in the, that, that that hotel and restaurant just evacuated of every of uh, fifteen twenty cars, four or five other trucks, and it was just a mad dash. For uh, beyond up to and beyond the Arctic Circle, and the the urgency was a function of the fact that to get to Inuvik and Tuktoyaktuk, you have to cross two ferries: the Peel River, which is a tributary to the Mackenzie River, and the Mackenzie River itself. Government free ferries so, um, operated by the Northwest Territories, and but they closed down operations at midnight. They were still hundreds of miles away from Eagle Plains. And it was a, everyone was on a mad dash to try to get those ferries before the government closed them down. Wow. So there was an element of adventure in that dynamic, I would say. But the moment, Clay and Dave, you might be familiar with a, with a phenomenon that I first encountered in doing reading on the Oregon Trail. It was, it was, it was a psychological phenomenon known as seeing the elephant. That is to say, a moment of quiet solitude, isolation, desolation, when a, a pioneer kind of reaches the psychological breaking point, can't take the drama of the trip anymore and turns for home. Now, we, that never quite arrived with us because we determined at Eagle Plains, you know, we're going to make it to the Arctic if we have to stay here a week. But on the way back, hundreds of miles, not another car coming towards us or passing us, we're literally out on the Eagle Plain by ourselves, and I began to feel it. So in order to kind of get back into a psychological comfort zone, I started playing some of my CD collection and, and songs on my iPod shuffle because I just needed to get to a different place psychologically. The, the sense of isolation was beginning to get to me, and that was, uh, I thought, an interesting moment. For me personally, a couple of things. Uh, what does gas cost at uh, Eagle Plain? At Eagle Plains is like about a dollar eighty a liter. 
I'm not smart enough mathematically. That's why I'm a historian. I can't begin to tell you what that translates into price per gallon, but I'm guessing it's like about five or six dollars a gallon. And how far? How many miles were you on gravel only? Uh, Eight hundred, four hundred each way. <laughs> so when you when you leave pavement, and you are now, as you said, I think a little earlier, you have you have left the last outpost of civilization. Did you turn to Dominic and say? Son, we are now about to penetrate a country at least 600 miles in width upon which the foot of civilization. Did you go into Lewis and Clark stuff? In a way, I did, because one of my annoying mannerisms <laughs> all those years, when, when he was a youth and my wife and I would take him to all the national parks, and that's how we became road warriors. Every summer after school, I thought we'd go see a new national park. And I developed this annoying habit of at some moment on the trip exclaiming to anyone within earshot, that is to say my poor family, this is one of the remotest parts of North America. Right. (laughs) And that, as I say, was a running joke in the family. So we get past the Arctic Circle. We're We're on our way to the crest in the Rocky Mountains, the northernmost stretch of the Rocky Mountains. And I, I look at Dominic, who's driving at this point, and I say, you know, this is one of the remotest <laughs> parts of North America. But for once, it was true. And we both had a good laugh about it. So when you get to the Arctic, tell us about what that was like when the two of you got out of the vehicle and walked to the beach or the shore and put your finger or toe or whatever it is into the Arctic. Well, it was a very emotional moment. The first thing my son quipped was, uh, because I, I, again, I, in, in family lore, I always wear my sentiments on my sleeve and I cry at the drop of a hat. It's just, I just get overcome with the emotion, usually tears of joy. In fact, always tears of joy. But I was strangely and oddly and unconventionally composed but he was getting a little choked up, and he says to me, he said, he said normally it's you who's beginning to feel it at moments like this. But uh, it, w- it, was, it was very emotional. I mean, after all, we had gone, at that point, 2,500 miles one way, the last 400 miles over uh, dirt road um, that was, uh, was often, uh, as I said, a, a concrete-like slurry. And uh, this had been a destination that he, more than I, had dreamed of reaching upwards of uh, 20-some years now, more than 20 years. And it was a a place that always intrigued me because of the McKenzie connection. So, yeah, it it was that we we took pictures of of each other at the sign that says Arctic Ocean. We had uh, Dave from Winnipeg. Again, that's one of the things that happens in dynamics like this. You meet people who you're only going to see then, you, who, for whom you only know their first name. Dave from Winnipeg sees what is obviously a father and son at the Arctic sign. Where at that point, we're the only two there. Dave drives up in his camper, sees that we're a father and son, begins to inquire into the origin of this trip. He's a hockey fan. We tell him the story about the Molson beer concert at the ocean talk about the new Seattle NHL franchise. And then he takes our picture, the two of us at the sign, which we hadn't had. We needed a third person unless we were going to do a selfie. So Dave shows up. And uh, Dominic um, just wanted to dwell in the moments. We went over on a bench and just sat out looking. He sat out looking for dozens of minutes at the Northwest Passage, Clay, the fabled Northwest Passage. We're looking at it. It's right there. No ice to be seen for hundreds of miles to the north. Uh, I took pictures of the nor- of the midday sun. I sent you that photo. I collected water samples of Arctic Ocean water. I've got your sample, Clay. You'll get it in due course. And so that's the kind of thing we did. So we're going to take a break here in a minute. But in 30 seconds, tell us what you're looking at. We have no idea what you're looking at when you're standing there. What Give us your Lewis. Your description is the first description the civilized world will ever have of this place. Well, you see an expanse of ocean blue, which it was uh, because it was a sunny day at that point. In fact, it was like we had gone into the eye of a storm. In fact, literally we did. We reached the ocean between storms, the one that had hit northern B.C. and Yukon going up, and we were right ahead of the next one coming behind us. In fact, it caught up to us later that night. But you see this expanse of ocean, 
uh, not a cloud in the sky, um, uh, no white caps. It was bre- it felt breezy, but there were no apparent white caps out there, and it it just stretched to the horizon in front of it, and uh, and a, a 270 degree arc behind us, of course, was the settlement of Tuktoyaktuk. One could see from the point, as it is known, that's where the Arctic Ocean sign is located, where the where the original distant early warning installation built at Tuktoyaktuk in the 1950s is located. Um, and um, so that, that's kind of the scene. It was, it was just wondrous in its exclusivity and remoteness. It was, in the moment, we had reasonably good weather, so that Dominic actually strolled out into the water. I took a picture of him up to his knees in the Arctic Ocean. I took my samples. We had lunch, took dozens of pictures. And after about two hours, uh, with nothing else to with uh, nothing else to accomplish, we turned around and started the voyage home, as it were. That's a great image, uh, David. We're going to take a short break. Will you will you stay with us for a bit more? I'd love to. Thanks, David. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Let me jump in here. I'm Clay Jenkins, and just to invite you to come with me to Cuba our cultural tour to historical Cuba, February 8th through 17th, year 2020. All the visas and other logistics are in place. Wayne Fairchild has been there many times. It is amazing. Bay of Pigs and the Cold War, the Cuban Missile Crisis. Ernest Hemingway, who spent some of the best years of his life uh, fishing off of Cuba. And Roosevelt. Theodore Roosevelt, a man of destiny who climbed San Juan Hill on July 1st, 1898, what he called my crowded hour. And above all, I want to see Cuba before things really begin to change as it opens up to American corporate capitalism. So 8th through 17th February, Cuba, go to the Jefferson Hour site, jeffersonhour.com forward slash tours for all the details. Welcome back to this special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. On the phone with us is Dave Nicandri of Washington State, formerly the executive director of the Washington State Historical Society, the author of a great Lewis and Clark book, River of Promise, Lewis and Clark on the Columbia. Recently, with his son Dominic, a, an automobile journey in a Honda from western Washington all the way to the Arctic Circle and back again, a distance of uh, about almost 5,000 miles. Uh, Dave... Uh, you got there. You gave us this wonderful verbal description of, of what you saw there and your son getting in the water and, and um, the guy from Winnipeg taking your photograph. Uh, the town, Tuktoyaktuk, how big is it and what can I buy there? Uh, it's about uh, 200 to 250 people, I'd say, maybe a little bit more than that. It has a gas station or two, a grocery store, and you can buy souvenirs, although we didn't get any. I uh, I got a sticker that said, I survived the Dempster Highway. <laughs> that sticker, by the way, is now on my, is proudly emblazoned on the rear window of my truck. So not a lot to do there. I, I did see uh, just one of those tableaus that you never forget. We're actually leaving town. I see this young Native man, Inuit lad maybe 10 or 12, riding his bike out of town. And he's got a rifle slung over his shoulder. And he's going out hunting for Arctic hare, fox, I don't know. But I just don't routinely see people with a rifle slung over their shoulder. And given the modern temper and times, if I were now today, I'd be extremely alarmed about it. But there was just something that crystallizing about seeing this lad. And I want to say one thing about uh, Native people, too, because every once in a while we'd stop, turn out, take pictures, have lunch. And I just, I swear the truthfulness to this. Up on that road, people, Native people, always stopped to make sure everything was okay, without fail. Every time, if it was a Native couple, a Native person, they'd stop, are you doing okay? Do you need any help? And, of course, most of the tourists and everyone else would just kind of barrel on by. But I thought it remarkable that the Native people who, who have, whose environment that is, an environment in which they've survived for millennia, know that, pe- that survival is a function of community 
would always stop to check on the welfare of travelers going through their country. That was one of my major takeaways from this whole venture. Uh, that's a remarkable um, insight, and, and it says as much about you, of course, as it does about the people you encountered. Uh, when I think of Tuktiuk Tuk, um, I see Ramshackle. I see a kind of Quonset village. I see um, yes. maybe a lack of zoning. I see poverty. Yep. I see dogs. I see yep. that kind of sense of... Uh, you're in the far north, and um, and zoning is not the primary purpose. And Clay, you see everyone walking. That was one when, when we got to Inuvik, which was the former end of the road before the government extended it a couple of years ago. Uh, actually, this was Dominic's observation. He says, "Do you notice how many pedestrians there are on the streets?" And of course, um, there's no point to having a car in a in a town that says uh, that whose historic means of communication was by river during, during most of the year and over the ice for the other half of the year. And so probably most of the vehicles running through both of those towns were from tourists or government officials and the like, but the people who actually live there walk around and the taxis, I never, I have, I have not seen so many taxis per road mile. I mean, it was just, Phenomenal in its own way, but you're right. Zoning is of, of non consequence. Of course, this, these communities are built on the permafrost, which is now diminishing. So they're, they're built on stilts. All the utilities are above ground. Nothing is nothing is uh, uh, buried in the ground because you can't safely build in the permafrost. If I want to stay overnight, is there a motel there? There, there are some B&Bs, I think. Most people camp out or just make the run up and back from Inuvik, which is, a, which is the second largest settlement in the Northwest Territories, only Yellowknife on the Great Slave Lake, which is the territorial capital, is larger. So it's that district of the Northwest Territories. That's the major center, government, cultural, and otherwise. There's, there's lots of hotels, including the Hotel McKinsey, I should quickly add, in Inuvik. So there's a lot more infrastructure there, and it was in Inuvik going and coming back that we gassed up. So, Dave, uh, you carried these extra tires. Did you ever need them? No, but we knew people who did. There's no doubt in my mind that all of these uh, adventures that you had and these meetings that you had are tucked away in a journal somewhere. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, let me say to that, my friend, when Mr. Jefferson gave you his instructions— He said, you must keep a daily journal and bring back a faithful account of all that you explore, particularly things that are new or rare or unused to world science. Uh, Tell us about your record keeping. Well, I did uh, did keep a journal. Uh, In fact, I I used as my journal, Clay, you might recall the Elkbound Journal the Lewis and Clark Foundation gave to presenters at the conference in Astoria last year. So I, I kept that for this purpose and I filled it out. Uh, I've got about 40 pages. Um, I, I, I would keep a, a log of uh, where we stopped, when we met mileage thresholds every 1,000 miles, where we guessed up temperature time of day, uh, try to give some flavor uh, to what had, what had happened. Uh, but I think maybe the best way of characterizing what I was, was if, I, if I might and if there's time, just kind of read a few samples from it. Um, uh, would you like me to do that? Yes, I'd like you to go into your explorer voice as you do, but give us a few bits. Okay. Reading now. The drive back to Inuvik was the quietest two hours of the trip. In a way, it reminded me of the day Chris and I, Chris being my wife, drove Max to the vet to have him put down. What more was there to say? We both knew something meaningful had just happened over the preceding few days and few hours and will carry these reflections with us as long as we shall live. And then uh, 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 I have another entry here. I wrote, uh, this is when we're back at Eagle Plains. uh, um, And uh, and, and Clay, you will recognize the uh, trope that I'm about to venture into here. Again, from the journal. All return trips are anticlimactic, I learn again. There's less to discover, therefore less to talk about. I stopped keeping my journal uh, in reflection of this, but probably more in reflection of the challenge of coping with the serial moments that Tuck earlier in the day. The mileage count only really, really matters outbound. 
I'm writing this at Eagle Plain, now an, odd, now an oddly familiar place because of our being marooned here, which upon coming into view was one, was one of the more welcome sights Dominic blurted out, an oasis. <laughs> um, and then I just made a note, Clay, lastly, of, a, of a, what I'll call small things uh, I, I noticed along the trail. This was, uh, we're back in B.C. Uh, uh, when I wrote this. I made a note about the, na- the helpfulness of Native people, the pedestrians in Inuvik and Tuck, that on the way up, I found myself habitually looking for a, a signal on my satellite radio going northbound until the signal finally petered out north of Whitehorse, which is about uh, 61 degrees north. Uh, but that on the way back, I had no urge to reconnect to satellite radio and civilization. In other words, I had become accustomed to the silence and the sense of community with Dominic and the other people I had been encountering, and I was not welcoming the return to satellite broadcast, probably because it represented symbolically the end of the trip. When you're that far north and you don't see another car for three or four hours, but one passes you in the opposite direction, the air is so clean that you smell the exhaust fumes. Hmm. Um, I didn't see any women in high heels north of the American border. Um, Another curious thing, you know how modern vehicles have those uh, built-in compasses that tell you if you're going north or southeast or south or west or whatever? I had one. There's one embedded in my truck. But I noticed the farther north I got to the magnetic north pole, and in fact we got north of the north of the magnetic north pole, that device became very unreliable. What it would show as north was actually west and vice versa. So I found that was interesting. And then, uh, lastly, when you're when you're in in of course the day was about eighteen hours long, I began to re- I began to forget what day it was in the week, but the solar day replaces the lunar month and the weekly system as your frame of temporal references. What time is the sun coming up? When is it going to be noon? How much longer is the sun going to be up? All of that mattered infinitely more than what day of the week it was, what month it was. The solar day was all that seemingly mattered. And then I I I made a, a brief note here about these ephemeral um, trail communities that popped up, at least in my experience, they did. So those were some of the reflections I recorded in my journal, which I will keep for posterity's sake. And hopefully when my son opens it up 30 years from now, he can say, the old man was a nice guy. Oh, he's certainly going to say that. So this is a really important moment here. Um you and I have been friends for a long time. We have a theory about Lewis and Clark. It's sort of the Nicandre Jenkinson theory, and that is that every explorer is writing in a tradition. Nobody's writing on a blank page. You're writing because you know what explorers write. You, you've you been trained by your reading, by a whole range of other stimuli to know how to notice things and, and the language to put things in and the, the metaphors the, and, and the sense of the beginning of the journey and the end of the journey and being overcome by the sublime and being unable to express it and so on, you must have felt a little self-conscious, or I'm sure you do now, well, in talking about writing a journal when you have spent so many years of your life reading Lewis and Clark's journals and others of their expedition, uh, Mackenzie's journals from his two uh, major trips, Captain Cook's journals from his. What is that like when you know how exploration literature is supposed to go? That's a great point, Clay, and I'm, yes, you're right. Um, I'm used to reading journals. In fact, I'm used to keeping chur- journals episodically, so uh, that there was no novelty to that. But I, but I again, learned again, as by virtue of the fact that I had less to say, wanted to write less on the way back than on the way out. But I did learn how hard, how much work it is to stay diligent at keeping a journal. It takes effort. And I learned that you can't keep a journal in the moment of some significant development. You're too wrapped up in the, in the moment itself, physically, perhaps, emotionally, psychologically, you can only write about, well, about those moments well after the fact. 
Uh, and, uh, and, and so I, I, I had newfound appreciation for the dynamic of journal, journal keeping, how and when something important gets recorded, uh, but most of all, how much work it takes. And spe- I came away with, with renewed um, uh, uh, appreciation for the extreme diligence of, of Captain James Cook, who was the best journal keeper of the three that we've referenced in this dialogue. So, so Dave, uh, just to follow up on that, you just said something I think is a very important potential insight here that previously, my view at least, was yeah, if you write the journal six months in retrospect, that's kind of in a certain way cheating. But you're saying no, that you need processing time, that you, you in the moment you have to delay trying to come to terms with this experience because it's only going to begin to gel and make real sense in reflection later. If there's time, let me just read this. Go ahead. I'm of a mind to think that explorers would write a lot more reflective stuff at quiet times like these. There's only you and your thoughts, no other things to do but reflect. Additionally, how hard it is to keep a journal while in the midst of the moment. I think one needs separation in both time and space in order to cohere one's thoughts. I thought everything I've written in these few pages as they happened, but I couldn't have written them then, nor would truly have had the time to do so. We had to start for home, for better or for worse. And that way, we expect too much of explorers, wishing they had said more, been more reflective, etc. But it takes a lot of diligence just to keep a log let alone to connect the narrative dots. Uh, Dave Nicandri, as we close here this extraordinary conversation, and believe me, I wish we could just go on and on. Let me ask you a last question here. Um, Garrison Keillor, in, in one of his monologues, says that when two people are driving, when they're not sitting across the table from each other, they're, they're, they're looking forward, they're on a, a, on a journey together, they get to say some of the most important things that they ever got to say. They get to have conversations that they might not have if it weren't for these special circumstances of the shared um, pilgrimage or the shared journey. I'm guessing you don't have to go into details, of course, but that you and Dominic had some, some pretty amazing conversations in the midst of all of this. That is of course true, Clay, and I shan't go into them because I don't want to sob within the earshot of your audience. But I can, the, the memory I have, for example, is we're, we're on, we catch the last ferry across the Mackenzie River. We made it. We made the mad dash north from Eagle Plains. And we're on the ferry. We are on the ferry crossing the wide Mackenzie River. And we just look at each other and we just broke, we both just break out in a hilarious laugh. That, that, that's almost hysterical. And we start kind of hugging each other and dancing. On the, I'm sure the crew members on that ferry must have thought, what's up with those two guys? But to borrow a line from Lewis's journal, Clay, in that moment, we were just transported with joy because we had done something that we had thought, one of us at least had thought about for 20 years, had been two years in, in the general planning one year in the detailed planning. At one point, Dominic says that earlier that same day, as we as we leave the Arctic Circle and we head for the ferries, he says, "Damn it, we're going to do this." And those are the kind of moments that I think Keeler is talking about. There were others I shan't go into them, but yes, that that does happen, which is why I've always enjoyed road trips with my son and other people because there's the, the being in that little cabin, being in that little module allows uh, 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 um, a divestment from temporal concerns, especially when you're out of radio range and you have have only the landscape and the person you're with to cope with, to deal with, and it can be an exquisite time and experience. My goodness, what a gift you've given us here, Uh, David Swenson. I just wanted to thank you for sharing all of this and what a special conversation. It's been terrific to talk to you. And I also wanted to wish you best of luck on the, the release of your new book on Captain Cook and uh, suggest perhaps you can come back and talk to us again when that book is available. I'd love to, David. I have, I have a publication date finally, May of next year. The title is going to be Rediscovering Captain Cook. Subtitle is The Voyages to the Icy Latitudes. And I'll just leave you with this last thought. I didn't get as far north 
as Captain Cook did on his Northwest Passage voyage, but I made it farther east on the Northwest Passage than he was able to do, and as far as Mackenzie got, and I feel in my own small way, I've become an explorer much like them. You have been listening to a very special edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We'll see you all next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701 701- 575-0727. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson.